people recognize that having systems that are more inclusive, having systems that allow greater participation, having systems that allow greater transparency, having systems that fight corruption are more likely to succeed. And this is again why, you know, through an institution like the World Bank, which is apolitical, you can also help transform the undercurrents for societies to evolve and change. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Bob Zellick this evening and to thank him for taking the time to be with us. Uh, as everyone knows, Bob is the president of the World Bank and is responsible for overseeing the, and advancing the bank's vision of inclusive and sustainable globalization. He became the bank's 11th president in 2007 and he brings to this position an immensely impressive record of accomplishment in government and also in the private sector. He was vice chairman of Goldman Sachs before joining the bank and before that he was deputy secretary of state, the position that was held under the uh, administration of President Ronald Reagan by our own John Whitehead. He held the cabinet post of U.S. Trade Representative from 2001 to 2005. And in that position, he forged an activist approach to free trade at the global, regional, and bilateral levels. He played a key role in launching the Doha development agenda in the World Trade Organization and led, that led to the framework accord for opening markets in 2004. He was instrumental in completing the accession of China and Taiwan to the WTO, and he actually quintupled the number of U.S. free trade agreements, enacting or completing agreements with Australia, Bahrain, Chile, the Dominican Republic, Jordan, Morocco, Singapore, and the countries of Central America. Not least, during the momentous days following the peaceful revolutions of 1989, Bob was at the Secretary of State, was at the State Department, and he was the lead U.S. official involved in the, in the two plus four process of German unification. Just one more point of introduction. During the year or so between Bob's leaving the State Department and joining the World Bank. He served on the board of the International Republican Institute, which is one of the National Endowment for Democracy's four party, business, and labor institutes that work internationally to advance democracy in their respective fields. And I'm told that Bob frequently said that this was the only nonprofit board on which he served, and that I think shows where his convictions lie, even though I guess you can't talk about it as much when you're at the World Bank. So in any event, that leads to my first question, which is to ask, if Bob, if you would share with, us, with the audience your thinking about world geopolitics and the relationship between power and economics. And I, I pose this question because I know of no one in public life today who seems to have a more developed concept of how we can create a more integrated and market-driven world. As I understand it from an article that Bob wrote in Foreign Affairs in 2000, before the 2000 presidential campaign, he wrote that the United States needs a foreign policy that respects power embraces freedom, appreciates the importance of international norms without making a fetish of international agreements, believes that we must find practical ways in an era of revolutionary change to advance freedom, and recognizes that there are significant forces in the world. And I think, Bob, in that article, you actually used the word evil in this connection forces that vehemently oppose this way of thinking. So my first question is, might you step back for just for a moment from your position at the World Bank 
and explain to us the relevance of these ideas to the world of 2010. Well, uh, Carl, before I do that, let me just uh, thank all of you for joining us. Uh, I've known Carl and uh, Ned for a uh, couple of decades now, and I've always greatly respected the work. As he mentioned, I had an opportunity to serve briefly on the IRI board. I'd worked with IRI before, but whether IRI or NDI or the business and, and uh, the labor dimensions, I really think this is one of the creative geniuses of the, the Congress and the Reagan administration, because in so many places of the world, I've seen the work in terms of trying to help societies help themselves move towards more open systems, uh, whether it be market economics, trade unions, building the institutions of democracy. And frankly, it's been uh, extremely important in engaging members of Congress with international affairs. Uh, their staffs and members of Congress will often go on these missions, uh, whether, it's, whether it's party building, whether it's election observing, and given the demands on members of Congress uh, from their home audiences, I found that this is, uh, has a benefit simply in engaging people uh, in international affairs. So I want to thank Carl and his colleagues for all the work that they've done on this. I also want to thank the FPA. Um, I had a little chance to talk about some of the activities the FPA does around the world. Uh, for someone who's spent his career dealing with the interconnections of the domestic and the international, I just think it's vitally important to have people uh, try to, again, satisfy what I find to be an interest all across the United States to dig into these issues a little bit more, whether it's from a historical side or an economic side or security side. But it doesn't happen unless people devote themselves to it. So I compliment both FPA and the National Endowment uh, for doing that. On the topic of, uh, loosely speaking, sort of economics and foreign policy, uh, this is one that's in some ways uh, kind of been the light motive of, of uh, my, my career. And it's, in, it's intriguing because I, I think one of the things that happened uh, during the heart of the Cold War was a lot of the thinking about U.S. engagement in the world was dominated by people that came more from the political security side. Understandable reasons. Those were the dominant issues of the day. But if you look back at the history of America and the world. And I once presented a PowerPoint on this when I was at USDR for some of the uh, Defense Department team. Um, from the very earliest days, you think about Alexander Hamilton um, trying to uh, restore America's credit in the world, uh, which if he hadn't done so, Thomas Jefferson would not have been able to buy the Louisiana Purchase. Um, if you think about uh, the early U.S. foreign policies, the good ones and the bad ones, whether it was the embargo policy uh, of Jefferson, uh, whether it was the freedom of the seas, uh, the whole notion of America's engagement in commerce. But then you go through period after period, the sort of the dollar diplomacy, um, you know, up to um, in the interwar period, which is supposedly be a period of American isolationism, you have the the role that is uh, played by the, the Dawes and Young plans and restructuring Europe. So there's a private sector element um, that is also connected uh, to an economic policy, but it's more fundamental. It also goes to the sense of how do you have healthy societies, but also, as you mentioned, the development of power in the world. And just to give you a sense of something from a historical period that might have applicability today, uh, when you go back and you look at the history of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, there's all the chapters about, you know, Austerlitz and Waterloo and uh, uh, Trafalgar. But I often like to point out that one of the most important chapters is the dry one that people often skip over of how Pitt the Younger restored Britain's credit. And if he hadn't done so, Britain wouldn't have been able to fight a world war over the course of 20 years. Uh, where Napoleon basically financed by stealing the property or as a cash basis. So if you're going to have a power in the world, you better have a strong economy and you better think about your long-term financing of your position in the world. And this is one of the interesting things coming out of this financial crisis is how U.S. and, and other countries will be perceived in the world. But if you go back to the great period after World War II of uh, America restructuring a world to try to avoid the problems that led to the breakdown in the 30s, the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the GATT that later became the WTO, the Marshall Plan. These are all critical notions of how you connect economics to your broader politics and security. So in some ways, 
it's interesting, when I was trade representative and we were trying to engage trade agreements and with the idea that maybe it was of our interest to try to strengthen uh, developing countries, uh, whether it be their democratic political systems, whether it be the cooperation in Central America, whether it be building partnerships, some people in the economic community thought, well, this is outside the pure trade and economic efficiency. Uh, frankly, I think that it had the multiple benefits and part of the challenge in policy making is how you can try to find these issues that have the combinations. And just to give you an idea today, uh, the United States has a negotiated free trade agreement with Korea that it hasn't passed. Uh, people talk about the U.S. engagement with East Asia. Uh, the only free trade agreement we have is one that we completed during my tenure with Singapore. But as um, the Bush administration negotiated this free trade agreement with Korea, you could start to see some in Japan saying, well, we don't want to be left out of this. And for years, I always thought a free trade agreement with Japan wouldn't be possible because of agriculture protection. But that's now changing. Their farmers are getting older. They're switching to their agricultural policies. I personally believe that if you had a free trade agreement with Korea, you'd likely have some interest in Japan with a free trade agreement. And just think how, in a matter of a few years, that could start to reposition these issues. Um, so to me, it's folly not to think about how you connect your economic policies with your security and political side. And one last point, which we can pursue from a net agenda, is at another level, what is trade and some of these economic issues about? It's how do you open up a society? It's how do you break down old structures, whether they be oligarchies or oligopolies? How do you create opportunity? How do you create chance for a middle class? How do you create uh, new freedoms on the economic side that may have political corollaries? So it's a natural support for an agenda of trying to uh, advance values. Now, of course, there's not a one-to-one -one linkage. They're going to follow in different paths. But I think it's a mistake to ignore the role of, of economics in the world in, its, in, uh, in, in whether American power or American values. And I'll leave you with one last anecdote. Shortly after I became U.S. Trade Representative, uh, Colin Powell, then Secretary of State, came up to me at a, a meeting and he said, you know, Bob, it's fascinating. Everywhere I go, he said, what people really want to talk about is the possibility of doing trade agreements with the United States or the economic relationship. And just as I talked with some of the ambassadors in this room, we recalled some of the ties that we had from that period. When I saw Secretary Clinton, not long after she had become secretary, she made the same point to me. So what's often missed in the United States is how America engages economically in the world is a big indicator to other countries of our stature in the world. And we'd be foolish not to recognize that. Well, you mentioned the, uh, the financial crisis. Uh, and uh, you recently wrote an article in the Financial Times in which you argued that it's the, actually it's the developed world today, the U.S. in 2008 and Europe right now, uh, that is precipitating economic crisis and seems to be trapped in alternating bursts of uh, Keynesianism and austerity. Whereas you argued that it's the, the developing countries that are focused on promoting economic reform and robust growth. Can you explain to us why you think we must, as you said, look to the developing world, as you wrote, to find a way out of the current crisis? Well, there's a couple of strains of this. Um, you have a lot of people here I know that have made their career in the financial world. If you just think back to the financial crisis of the 1990s, which was East Asia, Brazil, Russia. Uh, at that time, the question was, will China hold the currency peg? That was the big topic of people. Now you can't open up a business page without trying to have a sense of how's the Chinese economy doing, how's the Indian economy doing. And this reflects the fact that we're moving to what I've described as a new multipolar economy. Uh, now, there's, let me give you some statistics that drive this. On a purchasing power basis, about 43% of the world's GDP is now in the developing world. Um, the import demand since 2000, over half of it, has come from developing countries. So if you look at what people are trying to assess today, we're in a multi-speed recovery. China and India have grown quite well. Uh, East Asia has gone quite well. Latin America has done uh, relatively well. Africa has done a little better than uh, expected, but is, is still coming back. So the issue now is what's going to happen in the European context. So 
this has a whole host of implications for international institutions, trade patterns, shifting knowledge, and uh, frankly, a lot of people in the business world are quite aware of this as they think about their potential investment. And my point is it's not just a China or India. If you look at Southeast Asia, there's 600 million people, an emerging middle class. Um, 10 years ago, people looked at Brazil as a very protected closed market. Now they see it as an opportunity. You're going to see more of this throughout uh, Latin America. Um, the Gulf is changing. Now there's still problems, but a lot of the countries in the Gulf are setting themselves up as international logistics hubs. There's different possibilities. And one of the points that I've been making is, and we can talk about this more if you'd like, Africa over time can also be a pole of growth. So this can actually lead to a, a healthier world economy. Now, another piece that you touched on, though, is, is, is lessons. So it's not just sort of the demand uh, to get out of the hole that we're in internationally. And the point I was trying to make on that was that uh, we're now in a period uh, which is understandable after the efforts to uh, put money into the financial system or have the fiscal expansion, whereas you know, uh, Ken Rogoff and Reinhardt pointed out in this book about uh, this time is different, eight centuries of financial folly, you could, you could identify that the next question was going to be the repricing of sovereign credit because you got a lot of sovereign credit out there. And so is the question is, what are you going to deal with it? So you're now in a stage where, and this has been in the headlines in Europe, you're having a fiscal consolidation or people tightening. The point I was trying to make was if you simply try to tighten on the fiscal side without creating opportunities on the growth side, growth without necessarily more spending, and these are policies you can take on a deregulation side or remove red tape, create additional opportunities for small and medium-sized business and entrepreneurs, you're going to make this task much harder. And what struck me was that uh, last year when I attended a G20 meeting in Scotland, it was doer not only because of the weather, but also because there was kind of a Euro gloom over the meeting. And everything was of a negative sense about what we were going to regulate and how we were going to control this and the kind of the bad times. I flew to Singapore to an APEC meeting. And the mood there was very different. Not that people didn't see difficult times ahead, but in part based on their experience in the 1990s, they said, well, we're going to have to create stronger basis of growth. So whether it was Malaysia, whether it was Korea, other countries, they were actually talking about opening up services markets, which they realized, still compared to the US, are more closed, not as competitive. But they saw this as an opportunity to gain additional productivity, additional jobs, additional growth. So I think one of the challenges still ahead of the international community is how can we keep an eye on some of the lessons learned from countries that went through this in the 90s about how we build in growth strategies at the same time that you're having fiscal consolidation. Well, you mentioned uh, China and India a number of times in what you just said. And you know these are two great powers of Asia, but they're promoting growth from two very different political models. China offering an authoritarian model of growth and India a democratic model. And I know that as the World Bank president, you're not really in a position to advocate any political model, and I accept that. But might you still reflect for us on the relative strengths and weaknesses of these two models? In other words, is the built-in accountability of the democratic model an advantage in achieving growth? Or are there also disadvantages in efficiency of administration and decision making? And are the built-in disadvantages dealing with problems like corruption in an authoritarian system, are there built-in disadvantages? Because that system happens to lack what we call in the political world the vertical and horizontal forms of accountability, such as elections, independent judiciary, decentralization, free media. I mean, how can you control corruption without these institutions? In a word, how important for growth are transparency and the rule of law? OK, let me take this in stages. Uh, first, if you think about what's happened in the world uh, since 1991, when India launched its reform process, or China in the 1980s, it's been nothing short of astounding. If you look at the 
removal of people from poverty, uh, which is also a critical aspect of human existence, these, uh, th this has had an overwhelming effect. And part of the aspects of what's going on in the international economy is that at the end of the Cold War, you had about a billion people in the world market economy. Now we've got about five billion. It's not surprising that the system is going to take adjustments to that. Now, um, and, and if you think about uh, what differences that has made in lives and opportunities for people to go to school, the people have information access, simple nutrition, uh, these are, are you know, truly historic events. At the same time, I think, and these are going to be major economic forces in the world as I suggested. At the same time, one needs to recognize that uh, the early stages in terms of increasing uh, income and productivity, if you haven't been using factors of production, are going to be somewhat easier than the later stages. So some people here in the room might remember there was a period in the 50s or even the 60s where people thought the Soviet Union was going to overtake the United States because, frankly, the Soviet Union had done a crummy job, whether Russia or the Soviet early Soviet period in getting the most out of its, uh, uh, its possible economy. So they did have high growth rates for a period. I personally believe that you, just as you saw in Japan and you saw, it was see in other Asian countries, there'll be a point where this starts to level off. And, and some of the things that more developed economies have to learn, like how at the margin do you increase the use of technology, use of resources, improve productivity, they will also encounter. Um, so one, there's been some writing that suggests, oh, is this the new economic model? Is this going to overtake everything? Look, if you're sitting in Beijing, as the uh, officials are, they don't necessarily think they're on the top of the world. They also have huge challenges. They still have large degrees of poverty. They're going to have a demographics issue. And look at what you read in the paper now. What you're seeing is, of course, there's an increase in desire for their wage rates. So even in an authoritarian system, you see what are labor strikes in a system that's supposed to be a communist economy. Uh, and the, the, in a sense, the labor movement is bypassing the traditional unions. This will actually, I hope, increase their purchasing power. It actually creates other opportunities for development because some of that low value production might go to other places. And we're working with Chinese firms. Maybe this can also go to Africa and start a manufacturing opportunities there. So the next stage would be going back to your point about transparency and openness. You know, my, my own view is, whatever the society, a more open, transparent, competitive system across countries compels people to recognize mistakes, uh, to have an earlier warning about things you have to change. And um, obviously, India is a democracy. It's a democracy of a billion people. It's going through its own transformation. I think right now, the younger Gandhi will also is trying to actually transform the Congress party. That's what he's been trying to do uh, in the nature of, of also changing Indian democracy. But even take China. Uh, one of the former party secretaries I mentioned, I, I got to know, who is now head of the central organization department, it's the personnel department. One of the things that he is, was known for when he was the party secretary, I think it was, he was in, in Nanjing, was he was using polling data to try to get a sense of public attitudes. And they are using similar methods to try to assess the performance of officials. So they too recognize they're going to have to be alert to public opinion. Now, this doesn't automatically turn into a benign factor. So if economic growth slows, and perhaps there's questions about legitimacy uh, other than based on economic growth, might this raise a nationalist spirit? So there's no simple formula in this. But frankly, what I found not a huge amount of debate about across different political systems is people recognize that having systems that are more inclusive, having systems that allow greater participation, having systems that allow greater transparency, having systems that fight corruption are more likely to succeed. And this is, again, why you know, through an institution like the World Bank, which is apolitical, you can also help transform the undercurrents for societies to evolve and change. I'm old enough to recall that there was a period, uh, I, I lived in Hong Kong in 1980 on a fellowship. And when I was there, my Chinese students I taught at university thought democracy is something for the United States, it doesn't belong here, you know, so on. So this is the rise of Deng Xiaoping at this time from 78, very excited about it. 
Well, I look back and I look at what's happened since then and I look at democracy in Indonesia, I look at democracy in South Korea, obviously democracy in Japan, democracy in Taiwan, democracy with its struggles in the Philippines and Thailand and others. So I don't mean to be deterministic about this. I'm not a determinist <laughs> by any means. But I think that, you know, uh, again, there was a period where people felt you couldn't have economic development in East Asia because Confucian ideology would prevent entrepreneurialism. Well, that one's been put to rest. So these ideas of sort of simplistic notions that are going to sort of drive results in a deterministic way, I think we have to approach with a certain humility. And speaking from the perspective of the World Bank, we also have to approach these issues with a certain humility. So frankly, my view on this is you should be open-minded, you should be pragmatic. There's different things that work in different countries. We ought to try to share that information across countries. And uh, frankly, you know, learn some of the basic things, such as if poverty were so easy to eliminate, it would have been done long ago. See, these are not easy things to, to be able to answer. I'd like to think that some of those polls in China were done by IRI, but well, I don't know. No, they were done by the Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes they work together. Uh, in a recent we thought that was NDI. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually IRI, your, your organization. Any event, in a recent speech, you spoke of the end of the so-called third world and the arrival of a new multipolar and more egalitarian world, which you've already mentioned. Can you explain to us what you mean by that? And if the economic shifts taking place require a change in the global architecture, is the G20 that you mentioned, the meeting in Scotland, mm -hmm. is the G20 a successor club to the G7, or is the very notion of a club in this new world outmoded and too hierarchical? And what kind of financial reforms are needed in this new more multipolar and egalitarian world, and how is the World Bank adjusting to this new environment? Carl, the problem is you asked 12 questions. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I was asking Turn to focus was on the first one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's start with the third world. Well, I had a very nice compliment. You've got somebody here from the Economics Intelligence Unit, because if you read, read your last week's Economist, they went, they went so far as to recognize this as, a, as an idea of, of debate. That I'm going to call upon it for a question um, later. But first off, the third world should have been discarded long ago because the second world went 20 years ago. So goodness knows, at least the third world should have moved up to second. Um, <laughs> but my point uh, was more fundamental than learning how to count. <laughs> it, was, it was a recognition that um, the third world for many people was a category of the Cold War. And in a sense, it treated the developing world as a unitary group uh, not recognizing its diversity, its complexity, and in a sense, either as a residual or a manipulable group in the contest between the first and second world. That time is not only gone, but in, it's obviously demeaning to billions and billions of people who also have aspirations uh, for a better life. Now, what it also is saying at another level is that the developing world itself has got huge diversity. So we were talking about China and India, Southeast Asia. You look at the income levels of some of the ASEAN countries versus countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you have to be able um, to distinguish the circumstances to be able to try to figure out what you're going to do uh, with different countries. Um, another part of this was to recognize that the old north-south formulations need to be rethought and so, for example, as I mentioned in terms of pragmatic learning, uh, how can China support Africa's development? How can India support Africa's development? What about the possibilities of South-South trade? This also has implications for some of the international organizations. So you will find actually some larger trade barriers in some developing countries that are impeding other developing countries. So yes, developed countries should also lower barriers, but so should developing countries. So it's a recognition that we need to look at the world differently, including, as you talked about, international structures. So the G7, which was, uh, I used to take part in those meetings back in the 80s with Secretary Baker at the Treasury Department, that clearly didn't represent the key players if you're going to try to deal with the international economy. At a minimum, you need to include some of the major emerging economies. And then there's the debate, as there is in any international system, of how much do you balance power and representation. 
in a sense, the UN General Assembly is one extreme. You've got everybody there, but like the League of Nations, one country, one vote, will you get the action you need? The Security Council was designed with a different concept based on the failure of the League of Nations. But does the Security Council reflect current power relations? The G20 is another one of these accidents of history. I like to say a little tongue in cheek, it's an organization for our era because there's actually more than 20 countries attend, so the numbers don't add up. Um, but, but the greater issue there is there's a good and a bad part about the G20. It has more countries that would, could actually are important to addressing international economic issues. But as anybody in this room would know, if you have 20 countries at a table, or 25 in fact, versus seven or eight, it's probably harder to have the informal dialogue and to get things done. So I personally, I think some of the issues that G20 is going to be struggling with would be, number one, how do they use the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO? I think it'd be a mistake if they create their own bureaucratic structure. They should use our institutions. The World Bank is a G186. We have 186 members. So how can we feed in and support the G20? But I must add, while doing so, we have to be sensitive that I have a lot of member countries that say we're not part of the G20. They shouldn't be deciding for us. So how do you, how do you get that balance? Another key issue will probably be in any group the size of the G20, it will its effectiveness will probably defend, depend on informal interaction. So in other words, um, you know, uh, what will be, if I were frankly taking this perspective from the US, maybe there's kind of a, a NAFTA group you'll meet with. To the degree, if US and China agree, that will be very important. What about the US-European relationship? The Europeans meet as a group. You talk about the BRICS. So as is often the case, you can probably shape some of the policies informally in smaller groups and then try to use the bigger group in a ratification fashion. We've got the flag of the UN here. There are sensitivities of this with the UN. Uh, so, for example, um, China has been sensitive to the inclusion of discussion of climate change financing issues in the G20. In my view, that's a natural to do that, but they're sensitive about being seen as taking that out of the traditional UN system. See, my view is we need to work away from a traditional hierarchical model and think of this more as a network model. So if the G20 could help fashion agreement among the major players for a financing system for climate change, that could help the climate change negotiations. So it's, it's a further expansion of this basic question of something I've been working at in various forms in my career, certainly at the World Bank. How do you make multilateralism work? How do you modernize the institutions of multilateralism to fit a new purpose? I personally believe, just as I was saying, you know, one of the genius of the US uh, group after World War II was that they recognized that while the US was a major power, it needed both for effectiveness and legitimacy to work with other countries, whether alliances, trade agreements, institutions. How do we overhaul that for a different purpose? And obviously the logic also extends to the emerging powers <laughs> Some of the people here know when I was in the State Department, I developed this concept for China of being, a, of being a responsible stakeholder. This is the same issue. How do you have stakeholders in the system that share responsibilities? Let me just close with one other thought on this. Um, we recently were able to achieve an agreement on a capital increase for the World Bank. First time in 20 years, uh, because in this financial crisis in the past two years, we've done about $120 billion worth of business, been a critical support for countries, but we needed more capital. In doing this, one of the things that I'm particularly pleased about, but it's not sort of a headline issue, is um, over half the resources of additional capital will be coming from the developing countries. Sometimes price increases, sometimes access to some of their investment in the bank we didn't have access to, sometimes additional access as they got additional votes. And if I think back at, say, the Copenhagen discussions, if you could get the developing world to share 50% of the load of that issue, people would have thought it would have been pretty damn successful, or in the WTO issue, which I dealt with. So as a student of these multilateral organizations, part of the challenge is how do you get countries to share responsibility, which, by the way, means they're going to have to have more of a voice, too. And is that how the World Bank is making its adjustments in the current period? Well, that's one way. Um, there's a lot of other aspects. Uh, you know, at the staffing level, which is more within my influence, um, I made a conscious effort to increase uh, both women and uh, developing country people at, at, at all the levels of the organization. I think it strengthens the organization. There's a lot of talent out there. It brings different perspectives. 
Another aspect is the basic thing that um, I think we need to be more sensitive as an institution to treat countries as clients. There was a period, perhaps 15, 20 years ago, where the bank would sort of come in with wisdom and those thou shalt follow it. I don't think that works. Um, and there's a lot of knowledge out there that, frankly, we can benefit from, transfer to others. So it's a network model, it's a problem-solving model, it's a client service model. It's recognizing that much of the main activity of the bank uh, is not finance. So we have a problem. We're called bank. And so most people think that our main job is putting money out the door. In effect, you know, even if you take the numbers that I talked about, um, those who are dropping the bucket in international markets. So when we work best, we are trying to transfer some knowledge and learning from around the world uh, to client countries. We're trying to do it in a way that the project has a reach beyond the individual project. So it may be building markets or institution or capacity, maybe carbon markets, maybe microfinance markets, it may be uh, aspects of, of, uh, of local currency bond markets. And then what distinguishes us from an OECD or a university is we do have money to bring in. And what we're trying to be more innovative is different ways of doing that. So right now, derivatives are a bad, dirty world. Well, let me tell you, I'm using rain derivatives to help the country of Malawi, which is totally dependent on rainfall agriculture, so that if it doesn't have enough rainfall, it gets money to survive. So sometimes derivatives can be good things, too. So you know, these are innovations. Uh, another thing that uh, people here may be interested in our basic financial intermediation model had been borrow and we either make loans or uh, investments through IFC, our private sector side. We've now created an asset management corporation. We have an $800 million fund as a start, which are doing uh, investing through our IFC platform in private investments in sub-Saharan Africa and to a degree Latin America. And this is an intriguing possibility because it's one I launched before the financial crisis. I thought the financial crisis would actually uh, sort of lessen investors' interest. But what I found is we have a sovereign wealth fund from Korea, um, uh, Azerbaijan, Saudi Arabia, and a Dutch pension fund. And when I talked to the Dutch pension fund, they said, look, we now know developed markets are risky too. We think the long-term growth prospects are better in some of these developing markets, but we don't know where to go. You know, the information costs, the transaction costs are high. So we can help build that market, build an opportunity for other investors to come in. So these are some of the changes that we need to make as an institution to modernize multilateralism. I'd like you maybe, uh, last question before we turn to the audience, just to say, you've, you've mentioned Africa in passing. And you know, what the traditional view of Africa is, is you know, a lot of people think Africa is hopeless. Uh, but you've argued for a larger voice for Africa and that you have said, suggested tonight, and I'd like you to elaborate on a little, a little bit more, that Africa is actually taking part in this surge of growth in the developing world, at least in certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And if that's true, what are the implications for traditional development assistance? And with all due respect to Bono and Jeffrey Sachs, is there something patronizing and, and anachronistic about their thinking on development? Sorry about that. Well, let me start with, uh, <laughs> let me start with Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, obviously, there's a huge diversity here. You have about 900 million people. But if I try to give you a framework to think about this, I look at the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa in three categories. One, you have about a third of the population that live in countries that prior to the crisis had grown on average of about 6% a year for the prior 10 years. Not too bad. And what those countries are looking for are frankly what Europe was looking for 50 years ago. They want energy, infrastructure, healthy private sector, regional integration linked to global markets, um, and to a degree can we use the agricultural sector to increase productivity and income as a consumption base. Um, so there's a certain set of issues related to trying to support those countries on the path. There's another third of the population uh, that was actually growing in countries at about 9%, but they were primarily based on energy resources. And for them, going back to your point on governance, the real question is the governance and development. How do they make sure that um, they have an inclusive growth, they don't have an enclave economy? How do they make sure the, the money isn't stolen? How to make sure that, so it's, it's really the governance as opposed to financing is critical. And the last third, which is 
uh, a tragic category that Paul Collier has highlighted with his work about called the bottom billion is the fragile and post-conflict states. So these are the countries that not only affect their own population, but we have the data that if you're, if you're a country living next to them, it undercuts your growth by about one and a half percent a year. So this was the, I mean, the Liberias, uh, the, the Southern Sudans, uh, the Afghanistans, the Hades. Um, and one of the things that I launched at the bank, given my sort of multiple background, uh, was to see how we could try to approach these countries uh, more effectively. And in some ways, while this is an overstatement, the development community had treated these as simply harder cases of development. And what I really think is necessary is an integration of security, development, and governance, ultimately building legitimacy. And what struck me, given the fact I'd worked in trade or nuclear security issues, was the state of the analytical art in how you combine these uh, was pretty rudimentary. And so we actually do a big world development report every year, and this year we're going to do it on this particular uh, issue. And if you think about the importance of this, back to a U.S. audience, you know, this is, F this is the story of Afghanistan, what you're reading about, is, you know, how are you going to be able to build, you know, an education system, a self-sustaining agriculture, a state, the judiciary systems. So, or, or frankly, this is the story of Haiti, how you're going to have Haiti repair. So it's a critical area for the international community as a whole to get better at trying to how to deal with. And let me give you an example of the sort of question you unearth out of this. Um, one of the, when I was in Afghanistan about a year ago and I was talking to members of the business community, I asked them, what's your number one concern? And they said, the police. And I said, well, what in particular? They said, well, the police are predators, not protectors. So I then started to look around to say, well, where in the international system can you find trainers for police? You could find trainers for armies. But interestingly enough, until relatively recently, when the UN peacekeeping office started to develop this capability, there really wasn't a place you could go to get training for police. Uh, Italy has the Carinari, who have had done very well, so they're kind of brought in on a spot basis. But these are the sort of issues which you identify that say, well, if we care about this, we better figure out you know, how to develop this capacity in some institution uh, to do. So coming back to Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, some days I deal with people that say, oh, is it hopeless? And other days I deal with people that say, gee, is China going to come in and take it over? Well, if China's interested, obviously there's something there of interest, right? And it's not only natural resources. Increasingly, and this is where this opportunity could come in from China, is that there was a, the party secretary in Guangdong province, a man named Wang Yang, who had been party secretary in Chongqing before that, one of the rising stars. At the start of the financial crisis, he said something that got him slapped down a little bit from Beijing, but it's persisted. He said, you know what, maybe at the end of this crisis, we should not return to jobs producing footwear and toys. Maybe we should move up the value-added chain. And that's exactly what's going to start to happen there, and that's what you're going to start to see with the higher wage rates. So I went and talked with the Ministry of Commerce in China and some others and said, is there a possibility that you might be interested if we create some industrial zones in countries in sub-Saharan Africa, if we create the electricity, we create the ports and system, to be able to invest, have some of that investment in sub-Saharan Africa, or it may be in places in Southeast Asia. And you start to see an interest in exploring that. Now, this is not going to happen overnight, but this could be a very important development because for those of us in the development field, frankly, if you looked at the history of East Asia's development, export-led growth with Japan and Korea and Taiwan and Southeast Asia and to China, one worried, could Africa even follow this model because there was going to be so much of a dominant role for China? This shows a little break in this, a little possibility. So again, coming back to your point about growth models, in some ways I think one has to understand how the environment changes and be pragmatic about taking opportunities. Um, on the comment about uh, Bono and Jeff, um, you know, I'll say this. I, I honestly think Bono is, I, I've, I've developed a lot of admiration for Bono. Um, and and uh, one of the things that I admired, this was not the typical perspective of the uh, NGO development community. He was open to the notion of openness and free trade. Um, and he actually was of help on that as well as trying to highlight some of the other issues. Um, and, uh, and frankly, I think, you know, some of these people get into this because it might be part of their reputational or their brand. Uh, he's a very committed person to it. Jeff brings a different perspective, but it's an important one. Jeff uh, is a person who's pretty hard-headed about 
the importance of return, for example, anti-malaria. And look, the anti-malaria initiative that he helped launch, I was at the State Department at the time and I helped push through the U.S. government side, you know, has made a difference in millions and millions of deaths. I mean, in this, in, and, you know, we, we, there's still room to go, but this could, this is a huge type of, of, uh, of change. Jeff personally believes, but this is what political debates are about, was that there should be a much larger sort of governmental investment in some of these activities. And, uh, you know, I think there's going to debates about the usage of that, but I think he's, he's doing it for a good reason. Here's the category that I sometimes get a little frustrated with, and it's not those two. Now and then you have some in the NGO community, and you have to distinguish because a lot of the NGOs are key delivery providers or key advocates. But in some ways, they bring their view of moral certainty to developing countries. In some ways, I, I think it, it doesn't give the developing countries their due regard. Take energy. It's pretty darn hard to develop if you don't have energy or electricity. And, you know, in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, you have 10, 15 percent of the people have access to electricity. One of the issues I have to fight in Europe is people who, for example, don't want building any dams, okay, because uh, of the environmental effects of dams. Well, if you're trying to move to a low-carbon environment, you can get a certain amount, perhaps over time, from solar and wind and biofuels. But if I look at dam development in North America or the United States, it's gone pretty far. And there's huge possibilities for hydropower development. Now, I believe that we need to work with countries on the environmental effects, on the local community effects. But to say you shouldn't build dams is to consign people not to live with electricity. Now, we're going to have other issues on this related to fossil fuels. And this is another sensitive topic. But what I think uh, I found, and this goes back to your comment about the third world, one of, some of the best response I got on that comment was from developing countries in Africa because they didn't like being treated as a residual. They wanted to be treated in the same way that other countries have, but ones that are at a different stage of development. And so I think, again, one of the aspects of a different international system is let Africans speak for Africa. And that's part of what we're also trying to create in these new institutions. Great. Well, you know, we have a, a number of heavy hitters here in the audience. Uh, I'm going to call upon a few of them before we break. And the, uh, the first one um, is uh, Henry Kaufman, who wrote a book just last year called The Road to Financial Reformation. I think Henry is sitting over here, and there's going to be a mic there. So maybe uh, he could ask the first question. Well, Bob, I want to take you back to the financial markets, if you don't mind. It seems to me uh, that your presentation suggests that you are financially constrained in the traditional sense because the industrial nations in Europe, the United States, and Japan are borrowing a huge amount on their own. They're deficit countries. So by that very nature, they cannot be willing to be as supportive of the World Bank as they have been in the past. So it would seem to me, therefore, that you're going to have to continue to innovate in non-financing projects rather than being an ongoing big lender. Now, if I also follow your analysis that gradually the emerging world is going to become part of the bigger world, don't you think in two decades from now, the president of the federal of the World Bank is going to be someone other than an American? Well, as for the second one, it it's, may very well be earlier than two decades from now. Uh, and, and just so you know, there's a very, very strong aspect of this question about uh, voice in the debate. And, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, I'll just share this perspective, which I recognize as a slight parochial one. But, um, and that is, look, I've spent my career trying to make sure that the United States stays engaged in the world. And I've had to fight protectionism and isolationism of different sorts. And um, I think that there's a, at least there's a benefit to having members of Congress and others engage through the World Bank, and insofar as there's a U.S. leader of it, I frankly think that helps. Now, that may not be good enough, but I think it's something that shouldn't, people shouldn't uh, treat lightly. I mean, the United States is still a very big contributor to IDA, which are the funds that have to be raised every three years uh, for the poorest countries. So these will be decided by the countries themselves, but I guess at the same time that people think, what I sometimes hear is quite interesting, is maybe the president should not be an American, but 
I hope it doesn't also mean that it can't be an American. And, and also, when I think about multilateral organizations, this is where I'm a little bit of a hard-headed realist. You know, I don't think you're going to see an American UN Secretary General. Uh, there's a lot of international organizations where when I watched how it works, it's, it's as much a matter of politics as it is some theory of merit. So those are going to be the issues that countries have to engage with and kind of find their balance over time. Um, but I think the basic trend, it, look, it's a good thing. I mean, I, you know, I just brought in this, the, for the level below me, one of the astounding finance ministers of the world, Sri Mulyani Indrawati from Indonesia, has been a fantastic reformer. Another one is Ngozi Akanjo Welo, who did the same thing in Nigeria. Um, and I think this is fantastic. So this is the direction uh, we certainly need to try to move. But at the same time, I don't want the United States to disengage from these processes. Um, now, on the financing issue, um, you raise a number of points. Um, first off, I think that, and this is we, another fortunate thing, we've got some, I got an Italian chief financial officer who comes from the central banking system of Italy, he's done a fantastic job. We've come out of this financial crisis uh, in very good condition, our borrowing's very good. With this additional capital, we will be able to do additional borrowing lending. And part of the point that I made to the developed world was the, the beneficial multiplier effect for them. And let me just give you a slight further example. Of course, we finance projects based on what the clients want. But insofar as we've had some focus in this crisis, it's tended to be on three things. One is infrastructure, because we learned the lesson of China in the 1990s, that if you can invest in infrastructure, you can create jobs and build future productivity. If you look at investment lending in developing countries, about 50% of it is spent on capital goods, the type of capital goods that are built in developed countries. So there's a win-win prospect here. Um, you get investment in growth opportunities, removing bottlenecks in developing countries. You create the possibilities for exports and jobs uh, in developed countries. The second area is learning another lesson from the 90s financial crisis, which is that macroeconomic stability alone isn't enough. And that what we mean by that is if, if you don't have basic targeted safety net programs that deal with education, nutrition, you can lose a generation. Um, and you'll never get it back. And so one of the lessons we learned was, for example, Mexico, Brazil had things called like conditional cash transfer programs, which are uh, wonderfully efficient for about a half of 1% of GDP. Um, they give money to the poorest, and the conditions are that kids have to go to school and people have to get health checkups. They've probably done more for women's health in Mexico than anything in the history of the country. We now have those in countries all around the world expanding the lesson. Now, some countries didn't have the capacity to do that. So there we work with <laughs> groups like the World Food Program on food for work programs, school feeding programs. But it's, it's learning how to use the safety net support in a targeted, effective way. And one of the points I make with some U.S. colleagues, including in the Congress, is, you know what? There's some lessons the U.S. can learn about that, too. Um, and similarly, in the infrastructure area, you've got, we have the Indian ambassador to the U.N. here. Um, in India, it's commonplace now to think about private investment in infrastructure. But when Mitch Daniels wanted to do a long-term lease of the Indiana tollway system, it was almost his political death knell. Fortunately, it worked out quite well. He brought about $4 billion into Indiana. So let me pose this question. Everybody's talking about big debt and big problems in the states. Well, why don't you do what India does and privatize some of your infrastructure? Maybe the Indians are ahead of the US on some of this. So I think there's a lot of opportunities here if for people to cross-fertilize. But the last point on the markets is, I, I am, uh, we're, we're still in a very difficult period here. I just came back from Europe. There's a lot of uncertainty in those markets, and as Carl suggested, uh, my own view, at least as I'll say it for purposes tonight, is I think the big financial package that Europe put together bought time, uh, but there's still challenges ahead. And the irony now is, is that just as 2008 in the United States caused problems for the rest of the world, the sovereign credit issue in Europe poses a challenge for the world as well. Great. A little bit further down on the head table, Bill McDonough has a question. Bob, my question is about corruption. In the belief that one of the great stories of the New Testament is the woman taken in adultery, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Corruption, sinfulness is something that we live with, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Is it best to go about attacking corruption by saying, 
let's reward good behavior, or are there certain cases in which the corruption is just so outrageous that the country has to be put on a list of those that not even the World Bank under your fine leadership can deal with? Yeah, I think it's sometimes you do, uh, we clearly do withdraw, and it's, it's, it depends the type of projects you do, it depends who you do them with. I mean, in some countries you may decide that you don't want to operate. But uh, just to give people a feel of this from a different continent, a real life problem that we struggle with now, take Cambodia. This is a sophisticated audience. You know that Cambodia went through a genocide. If you ever go to, the, to Phnom Penh and you go see the museum there, it's, it, it'll leave you with nightmares for days and days and days to see the pictures of people, what uh, occurred there. So you have certain people in the Cambodian government who lived through something that probably nobody in this room could imagine. And probably what it's done for them in life is to think when you're on the bottom, you're nothing. You're, you can be destroyed in a minute. When you're on top, you take what's yours. But there's other people in Cambodia that are trying to build a modern economy, trying to reform it. So, you know, what combination, you know, what programs, how do you support the good guys versus the other guys? And those are, you know, some of the challenge. Now, in, you mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa, as I mentioned, with some of the countries, the, the temptation comes from natural resource development. So there, it really isn't a question of us putting in money. It's a question of can we work with countries to try to add transparency programs, openness. And this really runs throughout the whole society. And the best anti-corruption programs that I've found are not ones where outsiders come in or investigate it, although we have to do that as well, but you bring in the local society. So let me just again give you a small example, but this could be replicated a zillion times. A program where you're giving money to schools and you simply publish on the door of the school that there are supposed to be X number of textbooks and Y number of teachers and allows the people in the community to say, well, gee, we never got the textbooks and we only have one teacher. We don't have two teachers. And it, it allows, in a sense, the civil society itself to become the watchdog. And so programs that build in civic participation as well as transparency are the ones that I find to be the most powerful. But I think you also properly pointed out if you got corruption, there's a briber and a bribee. And a lot of the bribers have been from the developed world. So one of the initiatives that we launched, actually with my Nigerian colleague Ngozi Kanjawela, is the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative. And we work with the UN because it turns out that it actually is a little hard to go to some developed countries and free the millions, hundred of millions, sometimes billions of dollars that are stolen from corrupt leaders. So we need to make this uh, double side. Also the case of, of companies. Uh, one of the things that I've been pleased, this is things sometimes in the international world move a little slower than you would like, but you have, in addition to the World Bank, you have regional development banks. Our way of, of dealing with companies that have bribed is we, we have a sanction system, so we borrow them from our activities for a certain period of time. One of the things we were able to accomplish was to have a joint cross department with the other regional banks, because it was crazy to allow a company to deal with the Asian Development Bank, but not with us. But this takes time to do, but it's, again, it's a good sort of step. So you're right that uh, corruption is a critical issue, not only because you don't want to waste money, but it's probably the most corrosive aspect of trust in a society. I mean, look, we're discussing this here in the United States with the issues of financial system. But one of the things that I talk about sometimes when I meet with our procurement officers is that not only do they have a fiduciary trust at the bank to our shareholders and to other people who work there, but our people need to recognize how they are looked upon as a role model in the countries they're working. And if they somehow communicate that maybe you could ignore $5 here or $10 here or $50 here, that's the cost of doing business, that somebody will take away that message. And if they take away that message and it weakens the institutions in that developing country, that will be a price much greater than the money because trust once lost is very hard to retain. So I think part of this is, again, it, it goes back to the first question that Carl asked. You know, a lot of development we've learned is actually the institutions and good governance. It's not just a question of the economic return on investment. 
We have time for two more questions, uh, only that I'm, this has been really absolutely fascinating. You just talked a little bit about education, and when I was having dinner before I was meeting for the first time Irene Pritzker, who is very active in Ghana and talking about sustainable education, and I know that she has a question that she'd like to uh, pose to you. I think she's sitting at the head table right next to, uh, right near Bill McDonough. Thank you. Oh. Th thank you very much. Um, yes, I am working in education in Ghana and um, actually working in trying to create sustainable models of education in existing, very poor existing private schools that are not touched by any uh, financial, any access to credit whatsoever. What I would like to ask you is, it, it, the World Bank like USAID and um, IFC and many, many other international powerful agencies pouring billions and billions of dollars into education in developing countries. There are actually no programs, no real programs other than just financing broken ministries and broken political education departments. I would like to ask you as the World Bank, are you doing anything different to this? And what do you see as a way in, in, I mean, obviously, democracy depends upon an educated population. If there is an education, there will never be democracy. So as the leader of the World Bank, what do you suggest that these crazy agencies around the world who are just endlessly giving billions of dollars to broken institutions might do and what might the World Bank do to be more innovative about addressing, addressing sustainable effective education in the developing world? Well, first, uh, what, what we try to do is be open to a variety of ideas about how to fix what's, what's broken. And in some ways, your question is interesting. I, I find more willingness to innovate, including with the private sector and education in the developing world than I find in the developed world. Um, so, you know, I, when it comes time to school choice in the developed world, it strikes me as a little slower than I find in the developing world in many cases. But I think, you know, here's what I've seen more generally. The Millennium Development Goals, which I know you're well aware of, um, you know, set certain targets to be achieved by 2015. And in general, what we've seen is it was useful in getting many countries to expand enrollment at the early sort of primary level, particularly girls' enrollment often left out. But there's been a big problem in the quality. So the next challenge is how to move from numbers to improvement of the quality of the system. Um, but there's another issue, again, referencing the private sector side, that um, we're now starting to see in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's quite intriguing. For many of you familiar with the process after uh, the colonial period, you know that there was a very small educated elite in many developing countries. And so understandably, there was an effort to expand primary education and not as much investment in secondary and tertiary education. Um, on the one hand, that's important. You want to try to broaden the base of opportunity. And we try to, I mean, we support different ways to support, uh, you know, private scholarships. Um, I know we had a program in Colombia where we were helping people from poorer areas be able to, uh, you know, in a sense, get tuition payments. I went to an Indian program for girls that had, uh, uh, was supporting a, um, uh, it was a, um, a school academy type of area. So, you know, we're trying to experiment with different models and learn from them. But what I'm picking up more and more in Sub-Saharan Africa is a concern that they're not having broader opportunities for university education. And with uh, technology, we are trying to see whether we can tap into some more cost-effective models um, using internet technology as a form of education. Some of them private sector. The president of Botswana, Botswana being a more successful developing country wanted to have a science and technology university, a private science and technology university. So we're actually trying to use private sector investment uh, to uh, advance this. So I think there's actually some interesting opportunities to try to develop some centers of excellence 
and a broader tertiary basis of Africa that's probably going to be important to move up the overall uh, chain of development. But more broadly, coming back to your emphasis, you know, what you, I'm sure, see in Ghana is what you can see in, you know, in many, many poor countries where still the resources devoted to this for the number of students in a classroom, uh, in some cases it's, it's fundamental issues like whether there are washroom facilities available separate for girls or whether they will come. When you see a crisis like the economic crisis we had in the 90s or now, it's often if there's a small tuition payment, girls get the ones that are taken out of the school system. So I think you have to attack the problem from uh, different dimensions. I don't think that there's any sort of one formula. And again, if you think about it, I guess that would be true if you look at the U.S. too. I mean, I've been watching educational debates in the U.S., which is a far richer society, and clearly it's not just a question of how much money you throw at the problem. You have school systems that have large sums of money. And frankly, we also have bureaucratic impediments in the U.S. So this is not by any means to suggest that an excuse or rationalization for other performance, but we also need to look at this with a little bit of humility, because we've got a pretty rich country here, and we're doing a crummy job of educating people. You mentioned that you had chatted before with somebody from the Economist Intelligence Unit, and I know that Nigel Holloway is with us tonight, and I'll call upon him. I think he's at this table over here to ask the last question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about Afghanistan, or ask you a question about Afghanistan. Um, you were saying, and I think you know, the Economist uh, agrees with you that you know the concept of the third world has really disappeared. But we still have a, if you like, a rump of uh, uh, failing and fragile states around the world, uh, of which probably Afghanistan is a leading candidate, you know, in terms of our security and the security of many other nations. And um, my question is really about the interaction between economics and uh, security, because we read uh, of a, an official U.S. report which um, assesses the mineral wealth of Afghanistan at about a trillion dollars. Uh, and I think, for me at least, you know, uh, it uh, enables me to see Afghanistan in, in an entirely new light. But clearly, after you first read the reports, then you think, well, how is... Uh, uh, the economy, how is the government going to actually exploit that opportunity? And uh, it leads me to wonder whether uh, we should be, we, the West, US, NATO, should really be bringing in India and China and other, you know, serious players in terms of investment, not so much aid, but investment in some of these fragile st states to help Afghanistan exploit this enormous opportunity. I, I'd like your comment on that, please. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, let me, this, this, this is a topic that may be a broader interest, so let me, uh, let me approach this from a couple of different dimensions. Um, I'm very proud of our team in Afghanistan. They've been doing courageous work under difficult circumstances. And it's a little, as you talked about, with the fragile or conflict state, um, this is a subject of, of greater importance. And let me tell you kind of the lessons, the preliminary lessons we've learned. One, the government has to own it. If they don't own it, outsiders, no matter how well-intentioned, can't do it for them. And indeed, you run the risk of having projects that make people feel good or allow them to have a nice flag to say we've opened this school or that school but if it's not tied to the educational system so there's any teachers to show up, it won't work. And this is a tension, and I know this because I've been in the U.S. government. There's a tension to say, get quick results, and this other government doesn't have the capacity, whether it be Haiti or Afghanistan. So let's go build it ourselves. Let's be can-do Americans. Let's go build this and do this and so on and so forth. What takes longer, but is longer lasting, is something where you sit down with the government and you figure out what, given the capacity, can you do together at this stage while building the capacity to do more. And let me give you a couple examples from Afghanistan. There has been a huge development in improvement of maternal health and infant mortality in Afghanistan because of a very basic preventive health care system 
that we helped set up with a good health minister using NGOs, some Afghan, some international, to provide basic preventive health care. Most of you have read about the educational system and bringing girls into school, same thing, good education minister. There's something called the National Solidarity Program, many of you are aware of. We set up with Ashraf Ghani, the finance minister, which is about thirty to $50,000 grants for communities. They have local councils. They decide how the money is to be spent. I visited a micro-hydro project, sometimes at schools. People then own these projects. We have cases where people would fight off the Taliban because they're their projects. Interestingly enough, the government is now saying, and this is you know, one of the problems of Afghanistan is the centralized control versus decentralized system, is can we now use these local councils perhaps to develop other types of services? So connect it to the centralized system, but have, in a sense, a local uh, sort of buy-in. Now, to make this system work, you need an honest minister, and you need this effort to try to build with them over time. So I'll give you a real life example. Again, when I was in Afghanistan about a year ago, we'd done good work on education, we'd done good work, and by the way, there's, if you go there, you'll see your cell phone works in most places. There's a pretty good cell phone system, reasonable microfinance, reasonable health. Agriculture is a huge opportunity. I went to President Karzai and I said, the guy you got is not gonna do it. You know it, we know it. Now, there's huge opportunities for you to do something in agriculture. Give me somebody good in agriculture. About three or four weeks later, he did. And so you now got a very good agriculture minister, and we're starting to make some progress in this area. Minerals is the one that you then talked about. There's now a pretty good minerals minister. Not long ago, there wasn't such a very good minerals minister. And this connects to your point about outsiders. When I was in Kabul, I saw the NATO countries, the other major uh, donors. I also asked, and it hadn't been set up on my schedule, to meet the Chinese ambassador. And as you probably know, I've worked with China over 20 years. And um, I knew at this time that China was starting to invest, including in the minerals industry. That Chinese ambassador was probably the strongest supporter of NATO I met, including of the NATO countries. Now, why was this? Because he knows security is a real thing, and they wanted to develop the minerals industry. There's a point, this is good to me. I mean, and so frankly, you know, I, I'd worked when I'd been at the State Department to try to get China to recognize its interests in Afghanistan and for that matter, Iraq. This is kind of the responsible stakeholder, but it's a question of in life, if you order, try to tell people to do things that they don't really want to do, you don't have quite as good a success ratio. If you find mutual interests that serve everybody's interests and then try to figure out how to overcome the obstacles, you're likely to do better. So there's a couple morals in this, is that one is that whether in Afghanistan or Haiti, it's not, only, not always easy, but it's not going to be long-lasting unless you figure out a way to embed it in the country itself. And by the way, if you want to leave sometime, don't you think it's going to have to turn it over to them? And, and this may seem obvious, but let me tell you, most of the aid projects come from bilateral programs that are disconnected with the government's budget. Only about a third of the aid that goes to Afghanistan goes through the country's budget. Now, frankly, they don't have the capacity to deal with the full third, but they could do a lot more. You want to build the aid into the system. We run a multi-donor trust fund. We did it in Aceh, we do it in Afghanistan, we do it in, in Haiti. Now, one reason why you want to do this is, if you've got 30 donors and a government barely has five people show up to the ministry, they're going to spend all their time meeting the donors doing, you know, uh, sort of show-off projects that don't really accomplish something. Isn't it better to put the money in one trust fund work with the government with what capacity they have and try to build some objectives and build their capacity as we go. So there are lessons to learn. Now this doesn't mean that everything always works automatically. You gotta have some security, you gotta build this over time. I live in a world of probabilities. I mean, how can I increase the probabilities of success? And these are some of the lessons we learned from Afghanistan. Well, great. Uh, you know, we've actually overshot the mark by 15 or 20 minutes, but I don't think a single person here regrets that. And. Uh has not been fascinated well, don't by Don't ask them to raise their hand. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see anybody actually out there. In any event, I want to ask Dole Latif if he'd come up here, because uh, he's going to just have a closing word to say. But as he comes up, let me just say that Bob had proposed a, a model of a conversation tonight. And I think, you know, not many people can con conduct a conversation like this. And I think you really did it in a way that kept uh, everyone's attention for every, every second of this conversation. I said at the, uh, at the beginning that uh, I know of no one in public life who seems to have a more 
developed concept of uh, how all the things fit together and how economics relates to politics and power. And I think I've, you know, I think that was correct. And, uh, you know, I also learned from Bob tonight. He said that, you know, one of his passions is that he wants to see this country stay engaged in the world. And uh, that's what we're all about. That's what the Foreign Policy Association is about. So, Noel, why don't you have the last well, word? Well, let me just say that uh, this evening has been a further vindication of the joint venture, the very successful joint venture between the Foreign Policy Association and the National Endowment for Democracy. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Bob Zellick and Todd Hirschman for a very stimulating hey, and informative okay. conversation. We stand adjourned. Thank, Thank you very you. much.